in Africa at this 2021 extraordinary USA meeting under the theme of Rebuilding Peace. My name is Frenya Ruiz, President of College Investments Group, Catalyst for the African Peace Hashtag that we keep seeing the Africa that we want. Dr. Richter, thank you for being here with us today. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Carvalho Ruiz, and uh, Your Excellency, Ernest Baikuruma, former president of Sierra Leone. Your Excellency, the good luck, Jonathan, former president of Nigeria. Excellencies, dear friends, I'm very glad that you're convening this high-level session on the African Peace Engineering Corps. And I'm most delighted and thankful that you, President Kuruma, inspired and initiated this initiative, which will lay the ground for sustainable development in Africa. For us, this is very pleased to offer this Horasis Extraordinary Meeting, as well as future meetings as a platform to advance the African Peace Engineering Corps. I wish you a very fruitful discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Richter, for making yourself available despite your busy and important schedule. I know that we have over a thousand speakers today from all around the world, and they're working very hard um, build a better future for tomorrow. So I know Dr. Richter has a very busy schedule. So I know he's going to leave us. So, um, <laughs> we Due to COVID, we haven't had the green light to actually have a present a presential meeting. Um, I wish to share that the next meeting for Orasi will take place in Portugal in June, also virtual. The next one will be in China in October, and then in Asia for November, and then India. And hopefully one day soon we will be able to see a Orasi for Africa. That is my hope. <laughs> So in this session today, we will discuss the potential of an African Peace Engineering Corps and how and why it can be a game changer for Africa. As it was recognized during the first high-level roundtable hosted by His Excellency Former President Ernest Baikonoma, the initiative, the innovative initiative is exceedingly refreshing and could be a great asset for the continent. We are certain that its realization shall have an impact, impactful solution to some of the social, economic, and infrastructural challenges facing the African continent. We have an inspiring call to action before us as we leverage new multilateralism in a multipolar area where the strategic challenges of peace building and security in Africa require bold actions and efforts by all relevant African stakeholders and the international partners. To help us navigate through this important concept and its implications, we are thankful and privileged for this unique opportunity to welcome again an outstanding group of distinguished leaders who share common commitments to peace, security, and stability in Africa and are an enormous source of knowledge and wisdom. It is my great pleasure to introduce to you His Excellency Ernest Baikaroma, former president of Sierra Leone, an advocate for the African Peace Engineering Corps. His Excellency Goodluck Jonathan, former president of Nigeria, and founder of the West African Elders Forum. Mr. Russell Feingold, former U.S. Senator, former Special Envoy to the Great Lakes and Ambassador for the Campaign for Nature 30 by 30. General Kip Ward, first and former AFRICOM Commander, Commander of NATO Stabilization Forces and, and serves on the board of the Corporate Council of Africa. Dr. Vasu Budin, founder and director of Accord, like you said, 2020 number one think tank in sub-Sahara Africa for peace and security. So it is really an honor to have all of you here together. I'd like to kick off the round table with His Excellency, Ernest Bekoroma, 
You've been an advocate for the African Peace Engineering Corps. Please, Your Excellency, share with us your three minute introductory remarks. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Your Excellency, President Jonathan. Oh, we lost him. So we've lost President for participating in this all the world. I endorsed the African Peace Engineering Group Initiative in 2019 in the Global Visions Community of Forasis in Portugal because I believe that we need to tap the expertise and energies that are laying fallow in our militaries. I am coming from the background of an experience I have had when in my presidency we have a responsibility to build the peace and consolidate democracy, but more so to build the infrastructure and national cohesion of the country. And um, the military was very, very instrumental in our efforts. Um, coming from 11 years of war with Ebola and the mode slide, we were able to use the military and the military acquitted very professionally to the point wherein it really added value in our efforts, not only to develop the country, but to build in national cohesion. Um, in Africa now, since independence, we have observed that most countries have restricted the role of the military in just the constitutional protection of the countries. Some countries, I must say, have gone beyond that to utilizing the military, the building the social infrastructure and other things. But we have not seen an African kind of engagement in this direction. And yet there is a huge hidden resource, expertise that is paid for but that has not been utilized to the point where it is required to really accelerate the development that is required in Africa. And personally, from the experience I've been through as a country that is coming from a situation of a devastation and a war that is building this infrastructure, and having disasters when in the military during the time of our Ebola, in not only building the infrastructure, but also managing in the military of a capacity to develop, uh, support the development of our continent. That is why when this initiative was discussed in the Oasis, 
I endorsed it and I see myself in it. I have a great passion in it because I've experienced it. Uh, but we need to now discuss it, fine tune it, and you know, open it up for us to have uh, a buy in from other countries and also. Uh, we have to have a buy-in from the EU. That is why I believe this kind of engagement, the forum we are now having, will be an opportunity for us to, and also not only develop this concept, but also to prepare a kind of uh, 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 a framework that we can use the AU to buy in so that in the A in the, the, the African security peace infrastructure that is now being revealed, we can you know just fit in coming with proposals that can fit in that will enable us to move this pro project forward. Like I said, um the experience in Sierra Leone is phenomenal. I came in at a time when um, it was great, difficult for us. Um, Sierra Leone was the most greatest supported country by the UN in terms of keep peacekeeping. But by the time I left office, Sierra Leone was the most peaceful country in, 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 in the sub-region, third most peaceful in Africa. And we were able to export peace by sending our own military people out there in peacekeeping missions. And I believe with the kind of uh, uh, issues that are now addressing us, the need for us to go international, the need for us to go uh, uh, continental, uh, the need for us to address our issues of development in infrastructure, uh, not only social, but also agricultural. Uh, there is uh, um, uh, an added value for us to look at what is hidden there in the military that we can use. National kind of an um, African peace keeping operation that will address the issues of social development, developing our society, developing our communities. They are trained, they have the expertise, they can go into areas that the ordinary private businessmen do not reach. They can endure the difficulties that a private businessman cannot reach. The bill of in Okay, well, I know that they're having network problems. <laughs> I thought I was going to be the one with network problems today. I was prepared for it. Um, uh, the woman will be able to address the issues of training, uh, uh, equipping our family, and be able to address the issues of community, cohesion, peace, and quiet, that will be the basis for us to build uh, an Africa. Uh,
Well, we'll get him when he comes back in, but I would like to call to the floor next, Your Excellency, good luck, Jonathan, if you would be so kind. will implement the African uh, security sector architecture in a Thank you, President Koroma. Thank you, thank you, Your Excellency, for sharing the essence of the initiative and your vision for the future. I know it's excellent. I'm not sure what everyone else was able to hear. I know we're having some network problems, but I know that it is a great initiative or I would not be here today powering forward for it. So thank you so much. Your Excellency, good luck, Jonathan. Would you be so kind to provide us with your three-minute introductory remarks? Your Excellency. Your Excellency, you're muted. You're muted. Uh, he disconnected Hello. himself. Hello? Yes, sir. We hear you. There you are. Okay. Uh, right. I hope we manage through. <laughs> I'm sure we will. Your Excellency, President Bai Kruma, Your Excellencies, my dear brothers and sisters that have joined us. Uh, thank the chairman, Dr. Frank Richter of Horaces, for the invitation to participate in this year's Horaces Extraordinary Meeting on the United States of America with the theme, Rebuilding Trust. I also sincerely thank my friend and brother, President Ernest Baikorma, former president of the Republic of Sierra Leone, for bringing me on board to join him on this second high-level roundtable discussion on the topic on early contestation of political power that has well in security in our nations. This is a major governance challenge being exploited by bandits and terrorists. The outbreak of COVID-19 pandemic has further compounded a very bad situation for our continent. In terms of mortality from the pandemic, the effect on Africa is relatively low when compared to some other continents. However, the protocols of managing the COVID-19 pandemic, though established to reduce the spread of the virus and save lives has impacted negatively and worsened the already fragile economies of African states. The direct impact of a lockdown on families surviving on daily income was agonizing, resulting to an increase in poverty levels and a rise in criminality and other related vices. More than ever, Africa now needs healthy partnership with the developed world. We need initiatives that will promote businesses, entrepreneurship, as well as dialogue that will translate to actions to address our common problems. A call for a new African renaissance in, multila in multilateralism to promote sustainable peace and economic development is therefore imperative. The US success experience in partnership among multilateral institutions and world leaders to combat the novel COVID-19 pandemic is a veritable case in point. The issue of trust is very critical in our discourse on multilateralism today. Today, developing countries now believe that the developed nations pursue their economic interests to the detriment of the economies of developing nations. For this reason, 
most advice from the Britain World institutions, uh, such as the World Bank and IMF, are accepted with a high degree of suspicion. There should be deliberate there should be deliberate policies to address issues of trade imbalance. It's a good thing that some multilateral institutions like the World Trade Organization, WTO, which incidentally now has an African head, recognizes this imperative and is considering ways of building confidence and promoting mutually beneficial cooperation at both ends of the global economic divide. He uses medium to thank the world for electing Ngozi Okozo Iwela, a Nigerian, as the DG of the World Trade Organization. African nations continue to receive by way of aid may have helped the continent solve few social problems, but aid alone has not changed the face of Africa, neither has it translated to sustainable development. What will change Africa is industrialization. While I urge African nations to take the initiative of developing their economies on a sustainable manner through progressive leadership, I call on the United States and other industrialized nations to encourage the establishment of cottage industries in Africa, just as they did and still do in other parts of the developing world. Cottage industries that can process our raw materials, such as minerals, farm and forest produce to some level in the value chain that will meet the global standard for export will benefit Africa more than it in the long run. This will help create employment and sustainable livelihood, jumpstart industrialization and improve the economies of African countries. As President Joe Biden seeks to rebuild America and restore its global influence. Let me applaud its commitment, not only in restoring American global leadership, but its faith in multilateralism. The world needs this kind of leadership now. The United States and other superpowers should also look into the issue of proliferation of small arms and light weapons. As long as we allow the free movement of small arms and light weapons, the issue of banditry and other related crimes will continue to fester in developing countries. And this will not occur well in our quest for sustainable peace and development. If the world must sustain related peace, there is urgent need for the global management of the production and management of small arms and light weapons. War leaders must establish an international treaty to control the production and movement of small arms and light weapons, just as they have done for nuclear weapons. I'm particularly thrilled with the concept of African Peace Engineering Corps. I'm also pleased to be part of this discussion because this is an exciting initiative that responds to an important part of African peace and development architecture. Critically, it, re it reinforces the African peace and security architecture in many ways, which is why I believe it should be given the necessary support. It is my belief that for the effective management of peace globally, there is a need for multipolar centers. The African Peace Engineering Corps should be one of such centers. And let me uh, commend my dear friend by Koruma for his exposition on this particular topic. I believe uh, General Williams will do further. The noble objective well, of the- Thank you for your valuable and meaningful contribution in this discussion as we move forward. I think President Koroma is having network issues. Um, Senator Pinebert, I'm glad oh. that you were, able to, you were able to make it. I'm so sorry about all the technological issues. Um, welcome, sir. And uh, please could you share with us your three minute introductory remarks?
Thank you. Thank you for your patience. It's not your fault, my part, from you. Um, but it is an honor to join this a distinguished group, the two very distinguished presidents and the other panelists. And thank you, Dr. Richter. Richter. Um, uh, uh, President Karama has not only been uh, wonderful at initiating this African Peace Engineering Corps idea, but he's been a marvelous collaborator on our efforts with regard to preserving biodiversity on the planet. He's a member of our Global Steering Committee on Preserving Natural Areas, so his activism is, is tremendous. You know, Franny, I had the chance this morning to review the excellent program you did on this topic back in October uh, with the late President Boyoya and others. Oh. And so he's a wonderful man and leader. And so I got a chance to get a little idea of, of uh, as an outsider from Africa, but somebody very interested in Africa, you know, I can definitely see the benefit with regard to peace and conflict resolution uh, of this idea beyond the obvious things, such as the end of violence and food insecurity, improving state capacity this way. You know, I've, I've seen it over the years, ECOWAS and MONUC and other organizations trying to achieve these things in different parts of Africa. But for me, uh, it reminds me of when I was the special envoy to the Great Lakes Le region of Africa. And we had such terrible problems with Eastern Congo, with all the countries in the region competing and exploiting the resources there. The one thing that got everybody on the same page was the idea of, of making sure that they would cooperate with regard to the resources and the opportunities, tourism and others, of the lakes themselves. And so it's this kind of a positive, in effect, peace dividend uh, that this kind of uh, idea helps. And of course, it's especially valuable in harsh environments, as President Boya said in that last meeting, and, you know, in, in harsh remote, remote environments, Somalia, Mali, in the Sahel, uh, northern Mozambique now, eastern Congo, and now, unfortunately, uh, uh, Ethiopia. These are all places that really need the confidence building once the conflicts are over or subdued to make this happen. Um, and we see, I've seen a positive example of how this can work in Rwanda. I had the opportunity to tour the Akagera National Park. You know, during the horrible conflict there, it was essentially a military zone. Mm -hmm. And what's happened since then through the combination of international and national efforts, military and others, it's been turned into a great national park with all the animals and the neighbors in the region are happy with it. They're getting some of the benefit of it. The Rwandans themselves can afford the park. It's not some very expensive thing to go to. And it's a wonderful example of where an, an engineering, a peace engineering military organization can work very well. Um, Look, I'm not going to take up more time except to say there are naturally advantages to this and disadvantages. A couple of advantages, you can utilize young people who have been in the military for something positive. Every country has a problem. When they have a conflict, when those people come home, because they, what are they going to do? I mean, th think about Burundi and, and the youth there, for example. Think about our own country. A lot of the problems we're having that, that, that happened on January 6th were former military people. Who are, who are disaffected. So this has a positive result there. And I think it has a positive influence in terms of preserving the natural environment uh, in those countries that we desperately need and we need to preserve uh, the biodiversity of the planet, especially in Africa. And I think this can help there. Uh, cautions, you know, let's make sure uh, this doesn't confuse civilian versus military role. Let's preserve the rights of, uh, of individuals. The military doesn't start taking over areas. They have to be convinced of that. Uh, and it also encourages cross-border um, cross border cooperation between countries because these are naturally those kind of problems. Finally, I know I'm taking too much time. Um, that's my brief contribution. No, we'll have plenty of time to discuss. These are just the introductory rem remarks, but thank you so much for your thoughts and perspectives. They're very enriching. I know that you spent extensive amount of time there and I know that you're very passionate about the continent. So for us, it's, it's, always, it's always a pleasure. Thank you. Um, now I'm pleased to give the floor to General Kip Ward. Sir, your introductory remarks, please. Well, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, it is wonderful to be amongst the distinguished uh, group, uh, Excellencies, uh, by Karoma, Jonathan, uh, Senator Feingold, Mr. Gowden, and obviously, Franya, being back with you following the great session in uh, October, where General, uh, where President Bicaroma presented this and the great discussion, I'm happy to offer a few thoughts as well. I won't go into all the detail that the Excellencies and the Senator have laid out with respect to uh, the situation that goes there, 
Uh, however, I would be remiss if I did not acknowledge the importance of what the concept would be designed to do to promote long term stability. Uh, uh, like so many others, I indeed am deeply, acutely aware of the fact that uh, it is these sorts of initiatives that are the guarantors of long term stability in regions. Uh, the things that come along with development goals that are meaningful to the people in the region, the things that come along with governance and diplomatic initiatives that are in place to help them with their peace and their stability. Uh, clearly, uh, having security is a part of that dynamic. And in, and in that regard, uh, the notion of, a, of an African Peace Engineering Corps, for me, uh, has great utility and meaning. You know, infrastructure development, you know, modernization, uh, broadband expansion, utilities that are there that are dependable, transportation networks that means something for the advancement and improvement of their people. When countries have militaries, they're designed to protect their people. They're not designed to do anything else. They are there to protect their people, to cause their people to feel safe where they are and to protect them. And, and in, in that role, they can take on many, many uh, responsibilities, activities. And then when they leave, hopefully continue to contribute in meaningful ways. As was pointed out, uh, the fact that you have these skill sets that are there that could be utilized in a way that makes a difference over the long term to the people in the countries where they live and doing it in a way that causes a commonality, commonality to be seen amongst the regions and indeed across the continent, in my mind's eye, is a great example of how to effectively show the people that their security forces, once removed, also contribute to their further stability by contributing to their enhanced living conditions through infrastructure, through engineering projects, and other things that they require from day to day. And so I certainly endorse the idea, as was pointed out, there's certainly a care to be shown with respect to where this the proponency ultimately lies. And clearly the, the civilian government has to have that, but clearly how all parts of the society can contribute to the well-being, the welfare of the entire society is critically important. And uh, these skills that come from former engineers when it comes to helping to develop infrastructure, helping to develop programs, helping to develop those things that the people see is working for them, work in a direct way, and then being done by women and men who were former military potentially or not potentially, but to cause them to see that this is working for them in, so, in no uncertain terms. So it's an idea that I believe has great merit. It was discussed during my time as the commander of AFRICOM in many countries across the continent. So I know that there are countries that say, how can we use our engineering forces to do things that our people can see shows them as being their protectors and not their oppressors. And that's what we want to get to so that the people see their security forces as not oppressing them, but protecting and enhancing their viability. And this is a tool, a tool that could be used by the civilian leadership to help promote that critically important idea. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, General Ward, for your wonderful perspective. I know you have a rich, rich experience. I could sit and pick your brain with this all day long, literally. Um, <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Vasugujan, we would appreciate listening to your three-minute introductory remarks from the perspective of an important civil society organization in Africa. Um, I think we think it's extremely important. Please, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Franya and uh, President uh, Ernest Baikoroma. Thank you very much again for inviting us. Uh, President Goodluck Jonathan, Senator General. Uh, let me make uh, three points. Uh, you know, a cord has been uh, crisscrossing the continent for the last 29 years, the largest conflict management institution in Africa. We work in all of the major conflicts on the continent. As I've indicated, I've just come back from South Sudan, Sudan. Uh, where we're working on the conflict there. So the three points. Firstly, 
this is going to be the most challenging decade that we're going to face as a continent. And President uh, Goodluck Jonathan indicated why COVID-19 has exacerbated the situation. Our economies will go into recession or depression. Most of our economies, when in fact we need to uh, grow our economy. So the challenges will be uh, exacerbated, yet there are many opportunities and we are supporting the initiative of uh, President Ernest Baikoroma on the uh, African Peace Engineering Corps 100%. And let me explain why. Because the problems of the continent are deeply structural problems. They relate to the structures of our economy. Uh, and we have uh, poverty, unemployment and uh, uh, inequality simply because 90% of our continent is still agrarian. It has not industrialized, not moved into the services sector, not moved into the fourth industrial revolution. The problem with that is that we are uh, growing exponentially. At the same time, we are rapidly urbanizing, but we are not industrializing. So if you take the trajectory of development of Europe, Asia, Latin America, North America, when they were urbanizing, they were also industrializing. So low skilled farm workers moving to the center were absorbed into low skilled factory jobs and then it moves on generation after generation. This is not happening on the continent. So we, are, we have a large number of people because of climate change, because of conflict and many other factors that are rapidly urbanizing to the center, but they're coming to nothing. And both South Africa also. <laughs> oh, we can't hear you, President Koroma. I see you speaking. He disappeared. It's a network issue. Rania, I apologize. I have to, to leave, but I want to thank the other panelists very much, and please keep me involved with other programs. Oh, so, thank you so much. Thank you. So sorry. Good Did season, you? Tobango. Take care, sir. You too, sir. Thank you. So we'll wait for uh, Dr. Gundin to come in, but maybe we will tackle our first our first question of uh, our two question roundtable. So over the past decade, Africa has seen an encouraging shift in global narrative. However, in spite of the overall progress, there are still significant challenges to peace and security. The question today is how can Africa leverage multilateralism to promote dialogue and understanding in enhancing sustainable peace and security? Each one of you has three minutes. Who wants to go first? President Kurama? We can't hear you, sir. We cannot hear you, sir. You're muted. Dr. Gordon. <laughs> well, I'm not sure what happened, but, you know, maybe let me just, if, if, if I take a minute or so to conclude, you know, that's our problem is that we're rapidly urbanizing and we're not industrializing at the same time. And, the, you know, the real tragedy, as again, both the, their excellencies know, the Inga Dam project, which has taken us over 30 years, we have not resolved this, and the current negotiations over the Ger Dam between Egypt, Sudan, and Ethiopia. They are really, in many ways, a tragedy because both these dams, with their hydroelectric power, if they are resolved, they will e electrify the entire continent and we will be able to sell electricity outside. Without electricity, we cannot industrialize. So here is the major problem. We require industrialization together with urbanization, otherwise it's a problem. And what President Goroma is uh, initiating is an acceleration of the process of industrialization. Because without the support of an entity like the military, who have huge logistics capability, expertise, 
They also have discipline and they have systems. And we can utilize all of that together with the private sector on the continent, together with uh, governments and with our partners from outside. So, you know, there's the Peace Corps from the United States that could complement AFRICOM. AFRICOM doesn't only have to deal with insurgencies on the continent. You know, insurgencies and uh, dealing with that is a short term solution. The long term solution is dealing with development, whether we're in Cabo Delgado in northern Mozambique whether we're in northern Nigeria or northern Central African Republic, the problems there relate to poverty, unemployment, inequality. And so the short-term solutions are not going to help us. We need now, and therefore we support 100% the initiative of uh, uh, President Koroma. Thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, now he's gone again. I cannot wait for us to be in the same room again because this internet thing is... <laughs> it's enough to drive me. <laughs> President Koroma, can you unmute your mic, Your Excellency? Unmute. <laughs> so whose mic is working? General Ward, Your Excellency, good luck. Would you like to answer the question? Uh, are you hearing me now? Yeah. Yes, I hear you, yes. Okay, thank you so much. And let me really thank all the contributors, uh, uh, Dr. Bash really hit the nail on the head. The issue of um, multilateralism is key because no one nation is an island. And without relations between nations coming together to confront a problem, we cannot resolve the crisis. If you look at the behavior of criminals, uh, whether they are terrorists or bandits, I classify them as criminals. Some years back, these were limited to geographical areas, maybe within the bounds of a country. But now they operate across the globe. So the only way we can confront this kind of criminality is the approach to materialism. And I agree and encourage by Kroma for bringing the concept of African Peace Engineering Corps. And just like as I said, that if we have source, yes, we have the African, like General mentioned, we have the African, but the political strength of the African probably, uh, the focus is a bit limited. So this is a more robust approach where it will be set up in a way that it will continue to relate with other parts of the globe. And through that process, we will be able to manage the uh, security challenges we have in the continent. And of course, we cannot develop in a crisis tone environment. For you to develop, for people to come and invest, whether indigenous of those nations or foreign investment, there must be peace in Africa. So we need it, and it's the way to go. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency. We appreciate your insight on how to promote and understand being able to have the discussions necessary to enhance sustainable peace and security in Africa. Karoma, you're back. Your Excellency, yes. unmuted successfully. Thank you. Thank you. Well, um, I am of the view that we are on track. Yes. Um, what we have to do is to build on this initiative. Uh, multilateralism is uh, something that has to be handled by Africa and use as a tool that will enhance the development in Africa. We know that from the recent pandemic that the world is a global village and nobody is an island. And therefore, the focus is how do we ensure that uh, we work as uh, a global village, we respect uh, our sensitivities uh, in Africa and in
Africa, I think we have a responsibility to build our capacities. We have to build our capacities in uh, technology. We have to build our capacity in knowledge. We have to give our, build our capacity in ICT. And uh, we have to build our capacity in our people being taken out of poverty to a level in which we will become the continent that have to discuss on equal terms. And uh, when we build that capacity, I think uh, it, it will help the overall international engagement. That is why I want us to look at uh, the, the, the African Free Trade Agreement that is looking at building a common market in Africa. We have to ensure that it's not only building a common market, but pooling our resources together, um, in addition to building the intellectual capacity, uh, we must be able to be, uh, we have to use our endowed resources. Uh, now in Africa, we have 60% of the world arable land, and we have to utilize that. We have substantial deposits of our minerals and other uh, deposits. But I think um, if we don't develop the capacity and we don't act in unison, we will not be considered and treated as equal partners on an international uh, uh, engagement. So that is why, uh, to me, um, um, the AFRICOM will lay the foundations at the community level. When there is peace and development at the community level, there is harmony and development. We can build it up to the level wherein we can talk about international engagement. So I think I'm still of the view that we have a great responsibility to develop a bottom-up approach that we can enhance our capacity in uh, addressing international issues. Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency. Thank you, thank you. General Ward, would you like to share a few words? Yes, I will, and thank you very much. Now, I'll be brief. Without question, the notion of multilateralism is alive as well and is essential. When you look at how individuals, nation states operate, as is pointed out, we are all globally interconnected. And therefore it is imperative that when we seek solutions, those solutions are done in a partnership from a multilateral approach so that the solution that is, re that is reached is a solution that satisfies to varying degrees, the requirements of all parties that would be impacted by whatever is going on. When I commanded AFRICOM, and AFRICOM is not the end all to be all to be sure, and, and neither is uh, any single activity. When I commanded AFRICOM, the notion of regionalism was critically important. I paid high honor to the African uh, regional organizations so that our activities to the best we could make them, supported the goals and objectives of the nations as well as those regional activities. And so you had an exercise that maybe focused on some humanitarian or natural disaster and how partner countries would work together to solve that in concert with one another, not as individuals. Multilateralism is critically important. And as nations come together to work to solve these common problems, doing it in a way that brings benefit to the people so, and that the people have a say in what goes on to their benefit is so critically important. We paid a lot of attention to understanding what was going on at the local level so that the activities supported what the leaders wanted to have happen to elevate their people. The notion of how you get better 
product from your from your farms, uh, better clean water, uh, how you do things that enhance the the health status of of the people, the citizenry. And when it comes to a peace engineering core, these various skill sets can be requisite in there to be shared, to be shared. And as neighbors share with each other, it increases the feeling that they belong as one in one community uh, of support. And those things help reduce potential for violence. They reduce the ability of nefarious actors, bad actors to come in and take advantage of a desperate situation. We want to take the desperateness out of these scenarios so that the people know that their governments, their security forces, those who are empowered to help increase their well-being, to bring them a better quality of life, are working together just to do that in ways that make a difference to them, not because of something that goes on elsewhere, but knowing what's happening in their local levels and then bringing them solutions to those things that impact negatively their ability to increase their lives, their livelihood and their well-being from getting crops to market, from having access to food, from getting their children into schools, from being able to travel from place to place and relative safety. All of those are important and they are solved more effectively when they're done in a multilateral way across the region, eventually across the continent and indeed globally. And I'm convinced that a tool that could be used to help promote that is the great idea that's been brought forth here by His Excellency Mike uh, Roma, supported by all here to make that a reality to more and more people. That's when we will have true stability, enduring stability. Because as was said, uh, the things that are done just at the moment to stop something in and of itself won't keep it lasting forever. And so these are the things that will make it enduring. Thank you. Thank you so much, General. Your input is always right on target. Thank you so much, sir. Dr. Bunden. Thank you, you Brania. Let, let, let me say, firstly, I think, you know, an initiative like this has to be multilateral. Uh, and secondly, has to be African-led. So, I mean, these are the two key issues. Uh, now, I think both uh, Presidents uh, Koroma and President Goodluck Jonathan know that we have the African standby force and we have the regional brigades, uh, both of which have had limited success on the continent uh, in dealing with the problems that they were supposed to deal with. So I think we, you know, we need to look at a reconceptualized formula for how we deal with the, rather than an African standby force, an African implementation force that deals with implementing, you know, the, the peace engineering core. If I just look at the five countries on the continent, South okay. Africa, Nigeria, Egypt, Ethiopia, and Algeria, they have a one million men active military personnel. That's one million amongst only five countries on the continent. Now, think about that. We are paying at least 60 or 70 percent of them to sit in the barracks. That's a cost to the taxpayer when, in fact, they can be deployed as President Corona as, as, as uh, really, really. This is a very out of the box thinking initiative. And this is something that we could do with on the continent. But let me just say, Excellency, uh, by Corona, you know, maybe uh, because when we look at regional uh, arrangements, ECOWAS has had probably the most success when it comes to peacekeeping. ECOWAS has led on peacekeeping and largely, you know, President Goodluck Jonathan with the leadership of Nigeria, of course, in ECOWAS. So uh, I want to say maybe, maybe we need to look at, uh, you know, starting this initiative in West Africa through the ECOWAS framework, uh, within the framework of the regional brigades, and, uh, you know, maybe it will grow from there to the other regions. But, you know, I have less experience at a uh, state level. Both the presidents, good luck, Jonathan, President Mike Roma, I've sat in the African Union. They know how these things work. They know whether you can get it through, you know, the continental organization faster. You can get it through the regional organization faster. And, I mean, my own sense is given ECOWAS's uh, successes, 
in peacekeeping that maybe something like this could be done in the West African uh, region and then, you know, go to the rest of the continent. And, you know, Accord as a continental organization, uh, President uh, Baik Roma, you know, we've, we've supported you previously. We are certainly, uh, you know, very willing uh, to support uh, this initiative. And I, I remember, uh, President Koroma, when you were in South Africa and, and when we met, when uh, Sierra Leone got the Africa Peace Award, we had a discussion and you were talking about a dam in Freetown. And you said your problem is you've got rapid urbanization into Freetown. You have one dam and you don't have time <clears throat> for fresh water for the people. And we talked about, you know, raising the wall of the dam, but, it, you know, does the uh, uh, structure allow for that or do you have to build another dam? This is where the military can be deployed. I mean, there are qualified engineers in the military. And, uh, you know, General, uh, you know, uh, AFRICOM has had limited, uh, you know, success in, in terms of acceptability on the continent. Let's be frank about it. Some agree with it, some don't agree with it. But I can tell you, guaranteed, if AFRICOM works on this kind of initiative that is delivering infrastructure, it will be accepted gladly across. Okay. Sorry, I'm not. It's not clear. I'm not getting you. Can you hear me, Your Excellency? Not. No. Okay. Well, he's. Well, Hello. He's, yes, sir. Can you hear us? Hello? No, we can hear him, but he can't hear us. Okay, well, we will move forward. Thank you so much. After in the recording, I'm sure everything will come out. It's just... uh, 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 Franya, if, if I may, uh, yes, one, quick, one quick uh, response. Uh, yes. And uh, I just wanted to uh, I just wanted to make sure that uh, the what Mr. Gowden said was something that I truly appreciate. One of the things that, uh, uh, and obviously, you know, I've been out of command of AFRICOM now for <laughs> over uh, a, a decade. Yeah. Clearly, uh, the, oh, sorry, the sorry. command does those things that partner countries, sovereign nations, ask it to do. And what you have just indicated there was being done to limit to two degrees, and those countries that, that were asking for those sorts of support. And uh, I'm happy to say that uh, there are several uh, uh, state partner programs uh, that exist where engineers have been to the continent to do exactly what what uh, you've talked to. And uh, and I believe I absolutely concur with you that those sorts of things are part of the toolkit that exists. Uh, and uh, and uh, so to be sure, I am certainly in agreement. And many of the capacity building initiatives that are being undertaken uh, is inclusive of those sorts of things. One of our mantles was building partner capacity and capacity included those types of areas as well, uh, those sorts of engineering things. Uh, and so I'm in full agreement. Unfortunately, unfortunately, they don't get a lot of attention. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much, General Ward. I don't know if we'll get really to that last question because our last question is about the potential of the African Peace Engineering Corps. And I think that over these last 45 minutes, we've established that it has great potential. So maybe we'll just do a last round and you can give us your last remarks and closing remarks. And then we can get to the audience to see if there's any questions. Not sure if we'll have any luck with that today, but uh, we shall see. Uh, Your Excellency, Jonathan, good luck. Would you like to? He's muted. You have to unmute, Excellency. Uh, thank you so much. We, we've already said it all because all of us have agreed 
on the issue that it is really uh, valuable for us. The key thing is the modality of um, setting it up and how we make sure it is sustainable. I think the whole concept of the African Peace Engineering Corps, the way I look at it, is just similar to what my foundation tried to set up in the ECOWAS sub-region. Oh. Hmm? This is a very bad We lost his platform. Yes. Your Excellency President Obama, could you hear us? Yes, yes. I, I can hear you now. <clears throat> we seem um, to have lost His Excellency Good Luck Jonathan, but uh, we're on our yes, last round yes. for closing remarks. I, I think uh, uh, from what we have uh, discussed, I think there is a great potential in Peace Engineering Corp. And uh, this is uh, an initiative that we have to run with, an initiative that we can use our military personnel with uh, expertise uh, to develop our social infrastructure and not only limited to social infrastructure, even our agricultural capacity. I believe that uh, uh, in the next couple of years, the issue that will uh, be of threat to peace in Africa will be the food security because of the growth of our population. Uh, if we can utilize our military to come in and add value to engaging our people at uh, the base level, the community level, uh, the village level, to develop our capacities in de improving our agricultural productivity and agricultural uh, chain, and also uh, develop our social infrastructure in schools, uh, hospitals, and other things. It will help us to lay the basis of a peaceful environment. And without peace, we cannot develop. I mean, let us do, we have experienced it, and we also know that with peace and the use of the military, the capacity they have, we can build up our capacity in community peace cohesion, and then by extension, it will be uh, at a national level. And all the African uh, Peace Engineering Corp is talking about is moving it beyond those national level to international and continental level. So that is why I think it is a very important for us to continue to stay engaged, to develop uh, a proposal that will be acceptable at national level, regional level, and also at the continental level, so that we can have a buy-in uh, from the African Union, especially at a time in which the African Union is now reviewing the African security sector architecture. We can ensure that we have uh, a place in which the African uh, security infrastructure can use the African Peace Corps as, an, as a tool that can implement most of the programs they have in mind. So I think it's a great opportunity that we must all embrace and uh, run with it and uh, beyond Africa, uh, involve the international community, the, the other the organizations, the EU, uh, the United States of America, the United Nations to be involved in ensuring that we, 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 we move this uh, important initiative to uh, a reality uh, that will translate and transform the African Development Program. Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Your Excellency, good luck, Jonathan. You're back. The last thing we heard from you was your foundation 
and what it was doing. So please, if you don't mind picking up where you left off, where you got disconnected. What I said was um, the idea of the African Peace Engineering Corps is loud. I think it's in the same line that we came up with the West African Elders Forum to intervene in crisis. Without a peaceful environment in West Africa and the rest of Africa, but, uh, development. And of course, to fix the world, you must fix Africa. And I believe with such initiative, we'll be able to get a peaceful Africa and a peaceful world that we believe in that will lead to uh, sustainable peace and prosperity. So we'll encourage Microma to continue with this initiative. And I believe in the next discussion is the modalities. We must accept a modality that will work, it will endure, and it will be sustainable. I have to thank all the participants. Yeah, let, let me let me firstly uh, thank uh, President Roma for this uh, really groundbreaking initiative. But let me also say, Franya, next year at the Orasa seminar, we are not going to discuss the concept again. No. Uh, <laughs> no. Now, now, that, now, that have, now that we have you on board between the yes. Foundation and uh, the Office of President Karoma in collaboration. That's what it, I thought we're going to take the lead in putting the modalities together. The is you. the responsibility given to you. I will give you my assurance, uh, President, that we will work Thank with you, you. Thank uh, you. President Goodluck Jonathan's Institute is there. Uh, the General, I'm sure you'll throw in your weight and your assistance, etc. But for sure, I give you my guarantee, we are going to move. The next time we meet at this Horasa seminar, we are going to put on the table the first uh, <laughs> initiatives of the 10-year plan that we have. So this Thank is going to be done. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you so, so much. Thank you. You know, just starting with a small victory that everyone can see and then let it expand, to be sure. Amen. Thank you. Yes. Thank you so much. So thank you, Your Excellencies. And I want to thank, obviously, Orasis and our fantastic audience. We've had a lot of people watching um, our great moments as well as our technological challenges today. Um, thank you all for your active participation, the great insight, the dynamic insight that you all brought. Thank you all very much. Have a wonderful, blessed day. And until next time, with the help of Accord, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Blessings all. Blessings all. Blessings. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Well, be in touch, President. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.